Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus, the risen Christ, our King. Amen. Well, I want to begin this uh, Sunday, after a couple uh, Sundays away from you all, with a word of thanks. I uh, mentioned or alluded to it at the beginning, but this, uh, this season, this last month of calendar time hasn't really gone as planned. There has been all sorts of things that have happened in our community and with your pastors that have taken us away from you. Um, And you may have noticed that Pastor Paul is again not here this morning and we continue to uh, pray for him and for his uh, the symptoms that he's experiencing because of a concussion. And uh, we don't know what his timeline is, but that has taken him away from this place that he so loves to be. And uh, over the last month, uh, we have uh, experienced quite a bit of death in our community, specifically uh, a close friend of Pastor Paul and I's family. Uh, And so that took me away a couple weeks ago uh, for the funeral of a dear friend of ours. And, uh, And then last week, I just got sick. I mean... Add that to the mix of, uh, of things that are going on. And so uh, this morning I wanted to make sure that I said a, a word of thanks because uh, it's not lost on me that we started this month with the theme All In and it has felt the opposite of that for at least your pastors. We would have at least liked to have been here <laughs> for a, a, uh, a theme that is talking about All In. Uh, we have not felt All In. Uh, But I've realized over the last couple weeks that this congregation itself has given a better sermon for what it means to be all in than we could have over the last few weeks. You all have stepped up in so many ways to allow for us to be gone. You all have gone all in. All hands on deck. All Uh, All of who you are, even parts of you you didn't know you could give. I know that people have uh, stepped up in those ways as well. Nathan Martinson and Kari Shoemaker have stepped in and given themselves over to preaching. Some of them only finding out uh, the night before, as Kari did last uh, Sunday. We've had uh, worship leadership and church leadership step in. Tammy and Steve Brown have led worship. Our council has, has, has come together and held special meetings and made big decisions. Our bands continue to come back week after week. Our uh, faithful leaders there in the back that are making sure we sound and look good up here. Uh, we've had people in our community uh, who have stepped in in the, in the case of emergencies. Pastor Mark Kopka at, at uh, Nordland Lutheran Church, I feel like, has been on call for the last two weeks, making sure that uh, when we couldn't show up, that at least somebody was. And so we give thanks for, uh, for him. We give thanks for uh, funeral homes that have uh, stepped in when pastors couldn't to make sure that families are being taken care of. Uh, and I, uh, a special thank you to families who have been grieving loved ones who have provided a lot of grace for their pastors when we haven't been able to actually be there. Uh, or when things have fallen through the cracks because we're trying to keep so many things going and when we've needed to be away ourselves. Every single one of you, whether I just named you now or uh, not, every single one of you has provided space has provided time, has provided grace and forgiveness. You've provided support and love to your pastors and to your community to allow for us to simply be human in this thing we call life. And so I just thank you from the bottom of my heart for the allowance to be a human being and to be away from this place, but also to be welcomed back. And we are grateful always. And it's just the last month or so that we realize it even more so, uh, the, the gift that it is to be a part of this community. So uh, uh, there's a long way of saying thank you for being who you are and for being the community that you are for not only each other, but uh, for your pastors uh, uh, as well. That said, I am a little bit weary. <laughs> I am a little bit weary. 
not necessarily from the inability that I ha- the, the inability that I've experienced over the last several months to have a normal week. Uh, and I'm not weary necessarily for all the extra to-dos that have presented themselves along the way and all the things that have erased the time to do the actual to-dos. Uh, yes, that provides a little bit of stress along the way, but uh, that is not the primary source of my weariness. I am weary. I've told several people over the last several weeks that I am weary, most especially from death. I am weary of death. I've counted at least seven deaths, and that's just the ones that I could count, at least seven deaths that have come close to this community and to me personally in the last month's time. And I am weary. And maybe you are too. Weary of death. I'm sick of, I'm tired of trying to point to a distant light somewhere out there through the blanket of darkness. I'm tired of having to wring whatever life I can out of the death that seems to surround me and all of us. And I'm not ignorant to the fact that death's power has come close to many of you who sit in these chairs this morning. Many of you closer than it's come to me. And your weariness, I know, knows deeper depths. And so I find it a cruel bit of coincidence or some sort of spirit-led nonsense that I'm not in on that the uh, text for this Christ the King Sunday is the story of Jesus dying on the cross in November. It is a cruel bit of coincidence that instead of the text we could have on Christ the King Sunday, something about the glory and the honor and the might of Jesus' kingdom, the beauty and the wonder of that heavenly kingdom where Jesus sits on the throne next to God, when we could have had something like that, instead we are greeted with the mocking and the deriding of Jesus and those words that are on, inscripted on his cross, King of the Jews, as he hangs from the death machine. Jesus' mocking and his death today used to mock our death-weary hearts while we're down. When we are consumed by death all around us, real physical death, surely, but also the death that looks like many different things. It could be change or scarcity or injustice or malice. When all we know is the imminence and the reality of death, how would we not then turn to our so-called king and echo the shouts of all those who were gathered by the cross on that day that Jesus died? If you are the Messiah— If you are the chosen one, save us. If you are this all-powerful, glorious, mighty king, why don't you do something? We're dying down here. Save us. Save us. And this gospel account from Luke mirrors this silence and inaction that Jesus elicits, uh, the, the silence and inaction of Jesus that elicits our cries in the first place. Excluding the words that are attributed to Jesus that likely weren't part of the original story, Jesus says nothing. Jesus says nothing. Through all the mocking, all the scoffing, all the deriding of those who are present, Jesus on his cross says nothing. Through all the demands that he prove his power by living rather than dying, Jesus says nothing. Absolutely nothing. And it is only a simple request. 
only a simple request that then ultimately breaks Jesus' silence. It's not a demand. It's not the insults that are being hurled at him. Not his innocence. Just a simple request from a criminal who recognizes who Jesus is and the nothing that Jesus has done to end up there next to him on that cross. Just a simple request from a criminal. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Remember me when you're done doing whatever it is that you're doing here. Remember me when this death leads you to your throne. And Jesus responds, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Facing only the reality of death, the criminal asks for mercy that he doesn't deserve. And Jesus, instead of giving him only mercy, gives him paradise. The criminal asks Jesus to remember him in this kingdom that will eventually come. And Jesus, is pro- Jesus promises him right there and right now to bring him with him where he's going. In the beautiful words of Ambrose of Milan, more abundant is the favor shown than the request made. More abundant is Jesus' favor shown than the request that could be made. We learn from Jesus' response and his interaction with the criminal that Jesus is for the people who are on the margins. People like those who hung with him on a cross of their own. People who saw nothing but the death brought upon by their sin and the sin of the world around them. Jesus, in promising the sharing of the kingdom with those who are crushed under the weight of earthly power, sin, shame, and death, has offered abundance where it feels like scarcity. He's offered fullness where it feels like emptiness. Jesus has resisted the calls to save himself so that he could give all of who he is and all of what he is to whom death comes close. Jesus, in his action on the cross, gives all of himself for all of us. Those of us who recognize, like the criminal who Jesus is and our own sin in this world and those of us who shout from the ground for proof of his power to save himself and us from death. Jesus, for all of us, says, Truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. You all know, as well as I do, that it's easy to lose hope in our weariness. In our weariness. When we spend our lives, or just a moment, on the margins of this world, pushed to the edges by powers of death and evil, it's easy to feel like we're forgotten. But in the cross... Jesus promises to remember the weary and the, and the powerful. He promises the kingdom of mercy to the suffering, to the sinful, and even those who scoff at who he is. In some of his final words here on this earth, Jesus reveals to us that the kingdom has come near to us, to be with us, to enfold us, to make us citizens of a kingdom of more abundant grace than we could ever desire or request. Brothers and sisters, you are part of that kingdom. You are citizens of this kingdom alongside one another. More abundant is the favor shown to you than any request you could ever make. 
God sees you when you feel invisible. God reveals God's closeness to you when you feel alone. God promises to remember you when you are weary of the death that surrounds you. And also, you are citizens of this kingdom alongside each other. More abundant is the favor shown to your neighbor than any request you or they could make. God calls us to see our neighbor when all the rest of the world would make them invisible. God calls us to see, uh, God calls, uh, reveals God's closeness to the other through us when they feel alone in their struggle. God promises to remember those who are on the margins from the weariness of death and in joining us together with him in in his death and resurrection calls us to be the ones who remember as well. We are called to remember our neighbor too. As we enter a season of thanksgiving, And a season of Advent, of anticipation of the coming of our God and who God is and what God is for our world. We we can be reminded that we have a hope to cling to in the promise of Jesus and his kingdom. This is the hope that Christ has indeed come near to us and to all people and that we are living in that kingdom that Christ brings here and now in the present. And that hope, the truth of Christ's abundantly merciful kingdom is revealed to us in Christ's giving of all he is to all of us. And with that hope that we have in Christ Jesus, we also have an invitation. We have an invitation to live in this kingdom of abundant mercy and give all that we have to its reign. To go all in on unconditional grace and love through whatever means we're able. To remember with Jesus all the people who are in God's kingdom and the power that we have to reveal that kingdom to the world. And so as you enter this season of thanksgiving and hope and anticipation, I encourage you, I implore you to remember as Jesus remembers. To be a citizen of this kingdom that he's called us to be a part of, using our time and our resources and our energy to remember our neighbor as Christ remembers us. So remember the homeless and the imprisoned and the hungry. Remember the poor and the unemployed and the undocumented. Remember the persecuted and the oppressed and the cast aside. Remember your community service centers and your nonprofits and your charities. Remember your church and your synod and your larger church in this world. Please remember the weary. Remember the ailing. Remember the mourning. Remember those who long after something more. Remember them as Christ remembers them. With all you have and with all that you are. And then finally, remember one more thing. Remember always that the favor shown to you is already greater than anything you could do or request. So let what comes from you not be a desire for something more, but simply in recognition for who Christ is and the abundant mercy shown by him to bring his kingdom near to those of us who are weary and heavy laden. For it is as Jesus has said for all of us, For all who are weary, but for all of us who are called children of God. So it is as Jesus says. 
truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for the kingdom that you have brought to this earth. A kingdom of love and mercy beyond all measure. Beyond anything we could ever imagine. Let that kingdom reign among us. Help us to see and to feel your closeness. Help us to know that we are remembered always. And because of the great gift that you've given to us in the death of Jesus Christ and his resurrection, help us to reveal that kingdom here on earth in all that we do and all that we are. Help us to remember those who are weary, those in need of your love. Help us to remember all people as you remember us. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.